Good afternoon and welcome to our Tech Up Talks. Today we have a very relevant um, Tech Up Talk on Tech Up Smart Buildings. It is with pleasure that I have joining us today, Patricia Ollinger. Um, I will give you a little background on, on Patty, if it's okay. Um, Patty Ollinger is the Executive Director of the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, GBAC, a division of ISSA, the world's leading trade association for the cleaning industry. GBAC is recognized worldwide as a leader in training, education, and certification for biorisk management, forensic restoration, decontamination, and infections, infection and contamination control disciplines. Uh, a program designed to assist facilities, institutions, companies, and governments to prepare, respond, and recover from events involving infectious disease, including pandemics. Patty is a registered biosafety professional, a certified forensic operator, a certified bioforensic restoration specialist, and has a BS in biochemistry and a master of law with a focus on international public health. So welcome, Patty. Welcome to our Tech Up Talk. I will turn it over to you. And as we go along, if anyone has any questions, we'll come back to them at the end and uh, please um, put them into our chat box there. So again, welcome, Patty. Oh, thank you. And you know, thank you to Don and Cecilia for um, this opportunity to talk uh, with everyone today. So I am going to share my screen and uh, let's see how this works. Oh no, it is not working real quickly here. Uh, so Cecilia, if I quickly send you, well, let me, do, I'll just talk through it. Um, I was gonna share my screen. No it doesn't seem like my system is allowing me to do that, but that's okay. Um, I want to just talk to you a little bit today on, on some of the things that we are doing and some of the things, the challenges that you're fo focusing on today. So in October of last year, I was asked to write an article and I wrote an article actually titled Facing the Next Pandemic. And it was published in January of 2020. And it basically the subtitle was a pandemic is coming and we are not prepared or not ready. And it was very interesting because that came out the week before the pandemic really hit and was announced. And the whole focus of that article that I wrote was not to say that, you know, we're not doing pandemic preparedness or anything, but to, but to really focus on what we're doing in place as far as that frontline worker. You know, are we prepared for an airborne pathogen? Are we prepared for a pandemic to prepare, respond, and what, I, what we call recover within GBAT uh, to be prepared for that next pandemic? So as Cecilia indicated, um, you know, uh, GBAC, as we refer to it, it's a lot easier than the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, uh, is a division of ISSA. And we became a division of ISSA last year, and I had been, you know, kind of a, the, the head of their, their scientific advisory board for, uh, since it was developed right after the uh, outbreak with uh, Ebola in 2014, in 2015. And during that time, what we had recognized is there were gaps in all of our industries, mine being in bio-risk management, those in professional disinfection or decon, uh, those that respond to, you know, real life events like hoarding or a crime and trauma scene, and then the professional cleaning industry. We recognize that separately we had gaps in our industry, but that if we pulled together, that we really had more, um, you know, we, we really focused and we filled those gaps together. 
and especially that whole need of a scalable response. We recognized that, you know, you don't just jump into a full blown, you know, bioterrorism or bio risk management response or pandemic response, that it really needed to be something that's scalable from what we would call routine or hygienic cleaning all the way up through or to a full pandemic response. So GBAC really, um, you know, I, I'm really proud of our, what we would call our advisory board. And our advisory board is made up of individuals who, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, several of them have just recently retired from places like CDC, our US Center for Disease Control, uh, Health Canada. A lot of us have experience in academia or pharmaceutical companies and real life experience and in, in working with uh, different countries around the world, both developed countries and developing countries where there's very little resources. And we also have been involved with a lot of you know, regulatory development and actually implementing programs, which is, you know, sometimes you don't see that together. But we, we really have hundreds of years of experience between all of us. And so when a question comes up, one of the benefits of, of the advisory board is to be able to sit there and go, hey, you know, Paul, have you thought of um, uh, this area? Or do you know of somebody who has this ex expertise? And our reach is very far. So one of the things, you know, that we're finding now and that I know that your experience are real concerns. We're also seeing really critical shifts in our work for, workplace cleaning, disinfection and infection prevention measures. We, we, what we're seeing is we're seeing that shift from, does it look pretty? Does it smell nice? To that whole, are we actually removing dangerous pathogens? And what we coin is confidence cleaning or hygienic cleaning. And we're finding that the whole world really is changing from that standpoint. We're seeing that the need for training is not slowing, but growing. And in the beginning, when GBAC was really put in place, and when I joined ISSA last year, what we recognized is that, well, what we had put in place was a lot of hands-on cleaning, or hands-on training. And that training was such that we would, you know, we were working with groups that really were responding to some of these really high, what we call high consequence pathogens, the Ebola's of the world, um, MERS, uh, uh, SARS, uh, you know, some of those situations that, you know, really took, you know, the whole full, what I would call space suit kind of thing, you know, the Tyvek suits and the, the powered air purifying respirators. And what we found was that all of a sudden when the pandemic hit, that you had frontline workers, you had the custodial services of the world and the residential cleaners and people who not were, were out there in the field on a day-to-day -day basis who were now being asked to do things that they felt uncomfortable with for their own safety, as well as what do they need to do to make sure that what the, their customers were also safe and that the, what they were doing was being effective. And so we put in place uh, in March of last year, because we couldn't travel, we took our, our, our hands-on training and we made a, a course that our fundamentals online course that was really um, all set from a standpoint of hitting those, those topics. Do you, you know, have you done a risk assessment? Have you looked at what kind of personal protective equipment do you need? Um, what kind of cleaning materials or equipment or solutions do you need? And we put in place those aspects um, for uh, you know, those, those questions and we put that training together. And to date we have a little over 20,000 people that have taken it worldwide. But what we found was that really wasn't what people were wanting. As soon as the pandemic hit, as soon as we started closing down facilities, the first question that I started getting is, how are we going to reopen with confidence? Not just for our own employees, but for um, our clients and customers to feel comfortable to come back into our facilities. And so our executive director at, at ISSA came to me and he knew that I had a lot of experience in quality management systems. I'm, I'm actually the convener for ISO for the development of international standards on bio risk management. 
And he said, is there any way we can get, you know, we had a thought of rolling out a program this fall on facility accreditation. He said, can we get this up and running sooner? I said, okay, we're going to be kind of building the ship as we're sailing it, but okay, yes, we can do this. And so we, we launched our facility accreditation, what we call GBAC STAR in May. And the whole program was developed to assist, you know, uh, facilities and uh, organizations to help them provide confidence, trust through a third party validation, recognizing that we had to do it virtually um, so that they had programs that were in place, you know, to keep people uh, safe, their employees, their customers, and their communities. And what we're finding is that, that, and this surprised us, the vast breadth of the program, the program meaning that K through 12 schools, or what really surprised us was having cities come forward and say, we want to be a destination location and a GBAC star city. City of Dallas was one of the first. And it, that just, that, to be honest, that blew us away. Um, having a city come forward like that. Hyatt Hotels was one of the, actually, they were the first that announced publicly that they were going to have all of their hotels worldwide become GBAC star facilities by the end of the year. Um, we had stadiums like uh, Miami Dolphins in the Hard Rock Stadium in, in Miami, uh, the Dubai Mall, uh, it, uh, American Airlines. And what we were finding was that it wasn't just the big facilities, it was also small facilities, uh, restaurants, cafes, vet clinics, uh, churches. Uh, we were just very, I mean, no pun intended, but no one's immune. Everybody was shut down in some capacity and everybody was starting to think about how are we going to reopen and bring back that confidence to pe for people to be able to feel that they can come back into our facilities safely. We also are finding challenges. I mean, we're putting in place new work practices that we didn't see before, touchless uh, entry into places. I went to the Together Again Expo in Orlando in August and, you know, the whole aspect of we registered online, we came through, we took our phones, they would scan our phones in, uh, the whole social distancing put, uh, putting in place. What does that mean? How far apart do our chairs need to be to be able to watch somebody uh, to be, you know, at a, at a speaking event? Uh, what does it look like to go to a spa? What does it look like? Where are our hand sanitizers need to be? You know, what do, what do restaurants look like today as they start to reopen? So it was really challenges. And I would also say that it really highlights the need for partnership. And the partnership is not only with us as facility owners or as implementers, but it's also partnership with our employees and partnership with our customers. Uh, coming down to a lot of behavioral issues. So what are we starting to see? We're starting to see that people in general are much more aware of hygiene. Um, you know, you go to the grocery store nowadays and you walk down the aisle. My husband and I were there the other day and he was like, did people not clean before? Because all of the cleaning products are basically gone, even today. And it's very interesting. We're all learning what a dwell time is. Meaning that, you know, you read the label and it talks about on the back of that label, it says, you know, for this to be, you know, used as a disinfectant, you need to make sure that the, the top of your, the, the surface is wet for a period of time, depending upon um, what they've been approved for. We're seeing leading indicators, you know, we're expecting that building owners are responsible for the cleanliness of their facility. If it's not, well, who's, who's going to take care of it? You know, hand hygiene is very important. The question of wearing masks or not wearing masks. You know, cleaning we're finding must be visible. If it's not, then there's question in all of our minds, is, is it being done? And this was interesting. It's, it's fun, of, it, I want you to think about this for just a minute. Washrooms, restrooms represent the rest of the facility. How many times have we walked into a place and walked into the restroom and it may be messy and you're like, Oh my, I wonder what everything else is like. Or you walk into a place and the restroom is just spotless. 
it gives you that perception. And it's so those visual cues are, we're finding are extremely important. From a personal experience, I've found that I'm high, you know, even though this is my profession, we're also, I find myself more aware of hygiene and cleanliness in different um, areas. You walk in, you notice if someone's wearing their mask right. You notice if the hand hygiene, um, the alcohol hand sanitizer is there, if it's empty or if it's full. You notice things like that. You notice even little things like, um, you know, um, it, I think it was, um, oh, Home Depot or, or, or Walmart, one of them uh, that I went into the, you know, they, they have the wipes to wipe down the, the carts. I've seen them where they even spray the carts uh, in, in certain locations. And so it's, it's interesting to see some of these things. I've had some extremely good experiences and I've had some that left me with concern. And I know that everyone has, has felt that way and, and questioned, should I go back here at this point in time? We're also seeing choices and this is confusing for folks. And, and we get a lot of questions from so many different people uh, with regard to those who are going through our accreditation program or who have gone through our training programs about equipment whether it's foggers or sprayers or, you know, surface protectants or masks versus respirators. Uh, we're seeing so many different questions and, and, and people really want to know what the, what the answers are, or what the solutions may be. If there's a silver lining and, and, and Dawn actually uh, had mentioned the silver lining to me, I totally agree with what she said. If there's a silver, silver lining in this, it is, that crisis encourages innovation sometimes. And if you think about that, look at all that we're seeing. And while it's frustrating at times, because the science may not be there or it may not be um, right in front of us, we're starting to see some very innovative solutions, whether it's robotics or artificial intelligence, or, um, you know, I'll even say it, you know, these misting chambers, while I question the validity of them at times, whether, you know, if I have COVID-19, I can walk through something and it may miss me. I question the safety and I want to see it. Um, and I want them to show me that it's safe. And also it's like, I still have COVID-19 if I had COVID-19. So what are those things that we're, we're protecting? And let's really, let's really talk about it. Um, looking at the air purifying systems or the smart technologies. And I think that's where we get to in today with the smart buildings and the new technologies for buildings. That we're going to see some extremely innovative solutions come forward through this pandemic that will better, that will be better for it in the long run. I get asked the question all the time regarding when the COVID-19 pandemic dies down, should we continue with our current initiatives? And that's a really great question. And what I answer is that we need to be prepared. You know, that article that I wrote really um, focused in on that scalable response. We need to look at what routine is or hygienic cleaning all the way up through full bone response. And we do this in other aspects of our lives on emergency preparedness but we really need to be thinking about that from um, infectious diseases, whether it's uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, or the flu, or some other, or the next pandemic that, may, that will come our way. So what we look at is that concept. The other thing that I think is really important is the concept of community, collaboration, and then learning and continuous improvement. And I think that that's more important now than ever before. We really, we really do see the importance of being together and opening together and working together to get back to whatever our new normal will be. So facilities of the future. Uh, I've done, I've been on a lot of design teams over my career uh, in develop in designing teams for laboratory containment, healthcare facilities, uh, office buildings and dormitories, uh, you name it. Uh, and it's interesting because I think what we're going to see is there's going to be a greater emphasis on health and wellness. Occupants are going to be insisting that our building owners demonstrate how buildings are safer, how they're healthier and how they're designed to support productivity. 
there will be many different answers because there's not really one size fits all. It depends upon the need of the facility and where we're located. Companies need to rethink about the impact of their space, including the physical layout, the technology, touchless design, and also that cybersecurity that supports those smart buildings. So really, you know, I'd leave you with a, a couple different thoughts and then we can open it up. I know that we're gonna open it up to questions. And that is, we need to be visible, we need to be present, and we need to be innovative. We really need to be prepared. And again, I really want to thank Dawn and Cecilia. And I'm sorry, I'll, get, I'll make sure that you have the slide deck. Um, but uh, that uh, for some reason, I couldn't get it to pull up. Uh, That's quite a but I everything. Great, Patty, thank you. We could go on and on and on. Um, so many relevant things. Um, one thing that you just said about our behavior uh, changing, I, I recently just had the same thing at a store where you have the wipes and you know the, the carts have been cleaned and you still want a wipe to wipe down the cart again and the thing was empty. And there was about eight of us standing there like, like we wouldn't touch the cart until we got the wipes to wipe it down. And you know, a few months ago, we never would have even thought of that. So it's interesting how we just have adapted to the new norm a bit. Definitely. So um, we do have a, quite a few questions here. So I'm going to start here with um, a little bit about yourself, Patty. How you started your career and led to your current role? You know, it's one of those things that's very interesting. You know, we go and we get our degrees in something, and then, you know, our whole intent is to, oh, that's what I'm going to do for my for my career. So I started out as a, as a lab research biochemist in, in a laboratory in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, my boss basically moved up and out uh, as far as he became this worldwide senior vice president for research uh, for the Upjohn company and pharmacy in Upjohn. And he had to dismantle his lab. And I was asked, I, I was actually asked if I would, you know, become like the safety coordinator for the research group. And I was like, I don't want to be a safety coordinator. And I thought, you know, it, one of the best pieces of career advice came to me. The head of HR sat me down and he said, here's the deal. If you ever think about wanting to move out of the lab, you need to be able to, the, the more you can get underneath your belt of experience um, is great because then you can add that to your resume. And he said, it may not be your ideal job, but if you stay in this for a year, you have something else on your resume. And I went, okay, fine, you know. So I took the position and I really stayed in it since. Um, you know, I was able to expand it into biosafety and chem safety and all these different aspects until the point that, you know, I, I uh, before I joined ISSA and GBAC, I was the assistant vice president for environmental health and safety and, um, at, with research administration at Emory University, and that was for both the university side and healthcare. And you know, it's it, it it's just basically looking at different opportunities to grow and to learn a different skill set. And that's really where it's led me to here today. And sometimes it's just being at the right in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, who would have thought that I would have led the safety team for the Ebola um, support? Um, but, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was being open to those opportunities for people, for people. Very interesting. It's great. Um, one thing here, I know you touched upon it a bit, but, um, again, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what are your thoughts about the blue light technology? Ah, <laughs> the UV lights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The pretty blue lights. Um, so, you know, we know that UV is a disinfect has disinfectant properties. Um, I think that the question comes in is that, first of all, you have to be cautious a little bit because those big lights that you see in healthcare, those are in unoccupied spaces. And so that's one thing that you have to be very careful. The other thing is it only is as good as where that light touches. So if there is a barrier in between the light and where you want disinfected or dust or a shadow, it, it's going to have its limitations. And so you need to know that up front. The other aspect is, you know, we're seeing them in HVAC systems. And some of the question that comes up is, 
is there enough contact time with the air as it goes across that um, those lights? And so there's a lot of questions out there. I think there's going to be some some areas where they definitely will be effective, but we have to go into it looking at what is it that we're trying to accomplish, and is this the best solution for that for that situation? Um, another question here is. What do you think the timeline is when our workforce will feel comfortable again? Oh, you know, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, it, it's a, it's going to be interesting. Um, part of it is going to be like I had indicated that those visible cues, what are we doing to bring people back into, you know, our workplaces and as, as employers, we need to be able to be really open, transparent, and communicate that. And what we're finding is that everybody is now sitting at the table, whether it's the CEO and the C-suite to the frontline um, folks who are, are the maintenance and the, the cleaning staff and the employees. And so maybe from that standpoint, this is, has been a good thing because it really has opened up those chains of communication. Um, the timeline, you know, it's going to be dependent, you know, I think everybody is thinking about that, the vaccine, we're going to have challenges when the vaccine gets here because we got to get people to go get the vaccine. Um, but it's also, you know, I think it's those visible cues are so important and our behaviors and how we, you know, respect other people when we're in our workplaces. You know, what I find is very interesting is even when you're wearing a mask and you're in, in a public space, we don't get as close to each other as we used to. Uh, you know, I'm finding that, you know, it's like you don't even need those little signs on the floor. We're already stepping back. And so I think we're going to see, you know, it's going to be gradual. And I don't think that this is going to, the, the, what has happened is going to be in our minds for a while yet. Thank you. This is interesting. I mean, do you think too much hand sanitizer washing is bad for you? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, it, it's a, it's a, I guess it's one of those things where it's a, um, which is the lesser, of which, which evil, you know, do you potentially have something that's contaminated on your hands or do you continue to use alcohol hand sanitizer or, you know, the, the BZK or, or washing your hands with soap and water? Um, I think at the end of the day, and, and both my sons are surgeons, and so it's one of those things where they have to wash their hands all the time, if you think about it. Thank goodness, right? And, you know, I've talked to them about, you know, hand health during the winter times and uh, in the past, and I think that's what we need to look at is our hand health. And, you know, making sure that not only are we, you know, washing our hands, and we're going to be washing them more, more often, but also, you know, especially as winter's coming on, making sure that we're, you know, uh, using lotion on our hands and keeping them healthy. It, I think that we're going to see uh, probably much more focus on hand health going forward uh, because we're washing our hands more often. Thank you. Um, this is in, okay. Okay, this is just one other question that came in here. Um, how is the dialogue going with insurance companies regarding what they will cover and not cover surrounding uh, sanitation standards, related events that impact commercial properties, and if there is an event requiring insurance coverage? Ah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, there are a lot of discussions going on on what that's going to look like. And for the insurance companies, what they're, they, you know, they, they want some type of assurance, obviously, from the facilities that they're putting in place certain things so that they feel comfortable insuring as well. And so I know that we have from for our accreditation program, and I'm sure the, the other groups uh, that are out there that are also looking at accreditation programs or certification programs are talking with insurance companies. Uh, I think you're going to see in the future uh, opportunity for insurance companies to provide a coverage, but that's going to also mean that we're going to need to, as facility owners, show that we're doing something that's going to meet those requirements. And the 
Well, we have many, but one other question um, that we have here, Patty, this is personal again. Um, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Oh, Lord. Uh, well, right now. <laughs> You're changing <it's> constantly. <laughs> well, um, last week, I'll give you an example. I, uh, and last week was not really typical, but uh, I got up one morning at 3.30 in the morning to do an international webinar for Europe and Africa. And I tried to catch a couple hours of sleep, and then I did a webinar for a symposium, uh, a virus management symposium for China. And then I got a couple hours of sleep and I got back up and did another symposium for uh, another uh, Europe, uh, Africa symposium. And so what, what, what we're finding is looking at, you know, working through some very big challenges, whether it's from a, uh, an industry standpoint, the convention industry, for example, or I was on calls today with a couple restaurant associations and I've been, you know, working with some museums and just different facilities. People are really challenged on how can we reopen and looking at things, um, whether it's uh, an informational a piece or, or really working on SOPs. Uh, um, I have a team right now that's very focused on the accreditation part of things. And we're also launching, what we find every day is that there's really other needs. We're looking at a a contractor program uh, that's going to be launched this week. Uh, we're looking at events. I mean, if you think about it, we have facility issues, we have contractor training and needs, but what about events like a marathon? Um, we're actually working with some groups uh, with regard to triathlons and marathons. And you know, what what's that going to look like going forward? So this, this pandemic really, I think, has highlighted the need for change. And it's going to come down to people really taking initiative to say, no, this is, this, we're, going to, we're going to make this happen. And that together, that's what we do. Well, Patty, thank you. Thank you. We could go on and on. And thank you for your time. We know that you're very, very busy. And we look forward to, you will, you will be on our main stage at our event on November 17th. So we will continue this dialogue. So thank you for coming today. And um, you will be able to find the webinar and we'll include the slideshows um, on our website, Tech Up for Women and our newly launched website, uh, Tech Up Smart Buildings. So thank you and uh, we will see you next week. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Um, and stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you, Patty. We'll chat soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.